Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carter Smith, and I have the privilege of, of working for your Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and I'm going to serve as the moderator for our discussion and dialogue this afternoon. And this really is kind of the capstone session, as Bob and others uh, commented. This is where we hope to bring it all together. And we hope to hear from all of you with respect to questions that are on your respective minds. We've got a very distinguished group of panelists, uh, men from the land, of the land, uh, men who represent uh, landowners, landowner associations, farmers and ranchers, and know these issues backwards and forwards. And so this is where the session, uh, the rubber hits the road. And we're going to talk about some of the policies and programs and attitudinal things that were brought up earlier today and hear from these fine gentlemen about what they think will and will not work in the great state of Texas. And so uh, just as a point of departure in terms of how this is going to go, I'm going to provide a very quick introduction to each of these gentlemen. Uh, we're going to come back and ask each of them just to say a few words to kick it off. And then we're going to open it up to, to questions. And uh, we're going to go to about 5 or 5.15, and then I think there's a, a reception afterwards. Um, we're very pleased to have with us uh, this afternoon Senator Glenn Hager, uh, Senator Hager, uh, sixth generation farmer and, and rancher from uh, my beloved Katy Perry over there. His uh, family has farmed over there since the mid 1800s. Uh, he knows these issues of agriculture and water and natural resources uh, really arguably better than anyone in the legislature with his background. Uh, he's a strong sportsman and hunter and, and property rights activist and I've uh, been very, very involved in, in many, many things that are germane to this uh, topic today. So, Senator, delighted to have you. Thanks for joining us. So, <laughs> To uh, the Senator's left is uh, Mr. Drew DeBerry, and Drew also hails from a farming family up in Olton. His family are row crop farmers, have a custom harvesting operation. Uh, the only one on the dais, uh, shame on us, that's a Texas Tech man. Uh, Drew, if you get boxed in by all those Aggies, uh, just yell for help. Um, Drew uh, has a long history of working in legislative related uh, things, worked uh, uh, for Senator Duncan, um, went on to become uh, President Bush's uh, kind of agricultural liaison. Uh, he represented USDA at the White House, was the Deputy Chief of Staff at USDA, and is now the Deputy Ag Commissioner uh, working with Commissioner Staples. So Drew, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your being here. Uh, to his immediate left uh, is Dr. Neil Wilkins. Um, I think all of you had a chance to hear Dr. Wilkins uh, this morning, uh, one of uh, the most respected wildlife biologists in the state. He's a director of the Institute for Renewable Natural Resources at, at Texas A&M and really one of the foremost authorities in Texas on endangered species and private lands conservation in the state. He's also a vice president of the Texas Wildlife Association. So Neil, thanks for being here today with us. So. Uh, to his left is uh, Jason Skaggs, and uh, Jason is uh, executive director over the uh, legislative and public affairs at the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. Again, someone who knows his way around these issues very, very well. Uh, worked for Senator Duncan in the, in the legislature, also uh, Congressman uh, Charlie Stenholm, and uh, also was a special assistant to uh, the chair of the Texas Commission on Environmental uh, Quality, uh, Ms. Kathleen Hartnett White. And so uh, Jason is a great authority on this and knows these issues very well. So Jason, thanks for joining us today. So thank you. Uh, to his left is uh, Jimmy Sartwell. Uh, Jimmy Hales um, from over in Sealy. His family is ranch there, run a, run a Brahma operation there since the early 1900s, uh, runs a cow-calf operation there with his, his father. Uh, Jim's got a, got a degree from, from A&M and uh, also Mississippi State, is that right? Uh, Jim, Kansas State, that's the one to your right who's got that Mississippi State, just seeing if you were awake over there. Uh, Jim is, uh, is an agricultural economist uh, uh, by background, and he's the director of public policy for the Texas Farm Bureau, and uh, I know he's just coming off uh, uh, their annual state convention in Corpus, and so he's been on the road, and really appreciate, Jim, you're uh, joining us and, and appreciate all your work on these, on these issues. So thank you, Jim. Uh, last but not least, uh, to Jim's left is uh, David Langford, uh, another sixth generation rancher from over in Comfort. His family has ranched on Block Creek there since the, since the 1800s. 
Uh, many of you know David uh, is one of the founders and vice presidents of the Texas Wildlife Association, a very uh, eloquent and ardent uh, property rights enthusiast, advocate for our hunting heritage, wildlife conservation, and good science. science. He's also uh, just an outstanding uh, photographer who specializes in very, very special western and wildlife and ranch photography. And uh, David has worked on issues associated with water stewardship, property rights, and hunting for many, many years. And we're delighted to have David. So David, thank you for being here. I think just as a point of departure, we'll ask uh, each of our panelists just to share uh, a few words to kind of kick it off and, and get the, the session going. And so uh, we'll start with Senator Hager. So, Senator, all yours. It's great to be here. Thank you. We appreciate it. You know, as, as we talk about our, our heritage and land and, and conservation programs and different innovative ways, as a legislator, and, and Carter mentioned, I guess, in the introduction that I, sh I probably know some of these issues as well as anybody in the legislature. Well, being I'm the only farmer in the legislature, I would hope I know something about some of these issues and they're near and dear to me. But you know, I was thinking about it on the drive way up here. And I think one thing that we really have to uh, categorize and separate out is, is the issues on what is private innovative solutions. And I think that's part of what the organization and, and efforts that Blair, you've, you've been leading and, and so many have been part of, and then governmental solutions. And I think so many times uh, people in general, even my constituents, my constituents would like to have less government involved. When I ran for the legislature, my family, they knew I was inclined to uh, be involved in in politics in some shape, form, or fashion, but when I actually said I was running, they looked at me kind of funny because my family, they voted, but that was it. They just want to be left alone, and they want to continue our farming operation. They want to provide jobs. They want to take care of their family, and they really just want to be left alone, and that's most of my constituents, and so, you know, my, my point being is when we turn back around, sometimes people say, well, we don't know how to do this, so maybe government can figure out a way to do that. And, and my point in just being in that is I think we have to categorize in two different mechanisms. What is it that government really has a role in and can really be effective? Uh, I, my, my staff and I were talking here just the other day about, I guess it was Proposition 8, if I remember which one on the ballot, about being able to have tax valuations for water conservation. And that was defeated. And so, you know, part of the question is really why was that when both chambers of the legislature overwhelmingly passed this concept, and it's something that we need so desperately in, in the backdrop of, of this year being in one of, well, one of the worst, only two worst drought on record in a single year that we've ever known, and only one in equal to this one, and that's because of tree rings, as we only know there was one several hundred years ago that even equaled somewhat near this one last year. And, and so you think, well, why wouldn't people be in favor of water conservation? Because everybody wins, not just the landowner, but the people in general in the whole areas. And, and I think in part, if you take some property that, that my family's close to in, in farther southwest Texas, and we wanted to do wildlife management and some other folks in the area, and you know, the local communities just said, uh, you know what, that's a lot of paperwork. You're in a drought, right? Well, it's always dry out there. And they said, well, do you have cattle? No, because we're in a drought. And so, well, in a few years, when you have to re-up it, just say you're in a drought again, and we don't have to deal with the paperwork. What do you mean? We, we have a mechanism in place for wildlife management, yet is it a little bit too bureaucratic? Is it a little bit too much headache for landowners? And so my point that I'm trying to separate out is, we have to find solutions where people don't say, you know, it's just one more thing on my back that I have to deal with. I think what's so important in, 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 in categorizing, and I deal with this, that I have a very rules district, but I also have a very suburban district as well, because you gotta somehow get to 811,000 people. And a lot of my counties don't have those populations, so you have both. And the interesting thing for me is that programs that exist for people, if you wanna talk about education of the public, you have to educate those who can benefit from the programs. But then if you talk about in suburban, urban areas, and I've been preaching this for several years, is that wildlife, agriculture-based groups, 
number one, don't necessarily have to make sure that their members are educated in the rural areas, but they have to make sure their members in the suburban urban areas are interfacing with their legislators. And they have to interface with their legislators on day one. And that's something that is big time missing, in my opinion, as Texas has moved from 20 to 25 million people in a single decade. You know, you talk about Katy where I live at, and Carter mentioned on the Katy Prairie. Well, a few more years, not going to be much prairie left. It's going to be homes, and no, no closer than where I call home. When you look at a map of Houston where I live at, in the next 15 to 20 years, that will be the center of Houston's population. And right now we're on the farthest western edge. And the center of Houston's population is going to be where I call home. That's amazing growth. And so the amazing growth is as you transcend and continue in that direction, and we continue to lose land to suburban development, it is so critical that those members in those areas have some tie back. And the amazing thing is, the people that I represent in suburbia, they want to continue to have Texas as a tie to the land. They really do. They enjoy to get outdoors. Years ago, I used to think in my, uh, my staff, we were talking to some folks earlier, and they were talking about how they went into my district and they enjoyed bird watching. And years ago, I thought, oh, well, those people don't really like the outdoors. Well, it might be people that are my dad's, my grandparents' generation, my generation. It, has me, it gives me a connection with my kids. Um, somebody mentioned how their two daughters don't want to hunt, but they really enjoyed being outdoors with them. And that was something that they could do and they could enjoy. And so the point simply being is, how do we make sure that we continue to educate the right people on the right things? And I think too often we lose track of, we don't need to educate suburban urban folks on the programs that are out there or the options that are out there you have to focus those on the people where it counts. And don't treat Texas like Texas is one big state because it is one big state. But what works in one region of the state doesn't necessarily work in another region of the state. And I think too often we're a little too proud of Texas is big and we're Texas, but it doesn't apply uniformly across 254 counties. If you apply that strategy, you're doing something wrong. So with that, look forward to everybody's comments and a little bit of a discussion. So thank you. A lot of what I've came prepared to talk about is uh, complements what the senator said, but I would say starting it starts with developing those stakeholders like Senator Hager, people in the legislature who understand agriculture, but also people in the legislature and throughout the public who understand agriculture and live in urban areas. Um, when I was thinking about this topic, the thing that came to mind is my role as a parent. You, my, I've got two boys and a little girl. The little girl is perfect, so she never has anything, never does anything wrong. But the two boys, every now and then, will get in a fight. Uh, they're they're usually fighting about a toy. Um, the most recent fight we've had is they both play baseball. They, they, if anybody who has young kids knows that the baseball bats for kids now are two hundred dollar devices. You can't just go buy a wooden bat like I did, which I couldn't hit a baseball with anyway. But these $200 bats, you buy one, you say, okay, boys, we have a bat. Well, they fight over who gets to use it. Well, you can't break the bat in half. Um, you, you, you can tell one, okay, well, you're not both batting at the same time. Let's just, let's just split time with the bat. That'll work for a little while. But at some point, you're going to have two $200 bats, which is what we have in our house. They look just alike. They're the same weight. They're the same length, but they're two $200 bats. But the, the problem with that when you talk about land is, as my dad reminded me when I was home for Thanksgiving and we were trying to decide what to do with the family land, God's not making any new land. Uh, we have a limited supply of it, and we've got to be careful with how we, with how we allocate those, those resources. Um, like the senator, I too was struck by the fact that this is a this is a discussion organized by private interest. Um, I get nervous when the government starts bringing together a discussion about something like this because the government has an uncontrollable desire to throw money at a problem, and most of the time it's a problem the government doesn't understand. Um, so kudos to you for being a organized by a private interest group of people coming together to say. What are all the solutions, starting with 
uh, a number of things that the private industry probably is already doing. Um, but just to kind of put a point on the problem with uh, government throwing, a, throwing money at the problem, um, there are three essential truths that are, in my opinion, unavoidable in any discussion like this. One, and I forgot the other two. Sorry. Oops. Oops. Uh, one, <laughs> the Department of Energy, is that it? <clears throat> it's, EPA. it's EPA. It's probably one of the two. One, private sector financial decisions are made based on market realities. Two, the market's driven by consumer demand. And three, consumer demand is driven by consumers. It all comes back to the consumer. And we as agriculture have to understand that, and we've got to make sure that our message, when we articulate that message to the public, um, caters to that, those three unavoidable truths and the realities that come from it. Uh, remember when, and I'm not really old enough to say remember when statements, but remember when standing up for the farmer and rancher was as motherhood and apple pie as anything you could do. Well, I've, in my short career so far, I've already seen that change. I see public policy officials, some, who see agriculture coming and are already looking at them as special interest. Well, here comes that special interest looking for fill in the blank, an exception to an environmental regulation, a special tax consideration, uh, a, a handout. Some people see what agriculture is asking for as a handout. Um, where did we lose the ability to communicate our needs under the umbrella of our values? Where did we move away from a situation where people appreciate the values that agriculture brings to their life. 10% of our economy in Texas that every, each of our 25 million citizens benefits from comes from agriculture. $100 billion a year comes from agriculture. One out of every seven working Texans works in agriculture. That benefits all 25 million Texans. But the most important thing is Americans enjoy the safest, most affordable food supply of anywhere in the world. Less than 10% of our disposable income is spent on food. Compare that to Mexico and China at more than 20 percent, and other parts of the world that is far more than that. Um, we've got to find a way to communicate our message, um, and I brought a few, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm almost to the end, so don't worry, but I brought a few examples of the way the message is coordinated. Um, if, if we can go to that first, oh, we skipped one. I found this, I actually ended up with a koozie the other day, and if you can't read this, it, the koozie I have is from Wimberley FFA, and it says, where would you be without agriculture? These are not koozies, these are t-shirts. And it has a picture of a naked guy there, and it says, naked and hungry. Well, that's, a, that's an aggressive way to get somebody's attention, but it gets the attention, and it makes people think about agriculture in a new way. Many of you have actually helped the Texas Department of Agriculture <coughs> come up with a new campaign called Agriculture's Your Culture. And that's what these next slides are. Animal care, family care. We've taken agriculture and we've connected it with something that is a consumer use on the other side. Made in America for an American appetite. Um, never wasteful, always careful. And go Texas Tech, by the way. If you didn't catch that, go ahead. Um, our way of life, your way of life. Keep going there. Now look at this one. Our work, your world. See the, the timber, see the pencil, see the paper. We're taking a message and we're, we're portraying it in a way that people understand, oh, trees, agriculture, oh, wait a minute, yeah, this is how it affects me in the classroom. Um, let's keep going here. Safety first for healthy seconds and my favorite one I think is coming up. Here it is. Going green without the screen. Agriculture was green before it was cool to be green. And we don't, green to us is the left side of the picture, not the right side of the picture. Um, sure, advocacy, speaking out for your opinion, that's important. But putting, putting that advocacy to work is what agriculture is all about. So my point here today is we can have a lot of good policy discussion, but until we learn how to, to, to define our values and refine our message and get consumers in our tent to understand and appreciate our values, um, we're losing the battle. So thank you. One of the things that I that I learned early uh, in the sessions this morning was, uh, I guess, a few blue collar principles that I that I jotted down, and um, and, and then I just kind of transformed them into into some things that made sense throughout the day. 
and, and, and they're not real specific or tactical, but I think if we filter everything that we do in fostering effort for uh, farm and ranch land conservation in the state of Texas through these types of principles, I think that, that we will end up with um, a, a better immune system out there. So basically uh, what I wrote down is, you know, if it pays, it stays, and we need to do more to boost profitability on farms and ranches. Um, and that profit can come from a number of things, not just what's traditionally been profitable. Profitable farmers and ranchers invest in their land and they buy more land. When land is in demand for its profitability, it competes favorably with fragmentation and conversion. So let me say that last part again. It competes with fragmentation and conversion so that we're not fighting directly those things that we've talked about today. If profitability is aligned with water, wildlife, and other environmental goods, we end up with a strong immune system and a landscape that is more resistant to loss of ag lands and fragmentation. Back several years ago, working for Senator Duncan, and there was this guy that kept coming by our office working for the Texas Wildlife Association named David Langford. And he was preaching land stewardship, land stewardship, land stewardship. Every committee hearing, every time every, he would hand you a piece of paper, or business card, or anything he, he uh, wanted to talk to you about was talking about land stewardship. And, uh, and, I th and, and I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm definitely not going to steal his thunder, but, but uh, it was effective. And uh, there was some really good headway made on that in, in uh, the several sessions that I worked on it. Uh, but some five years uh, ago, I went to work for an association with, the, uh, with the, the motto, protecting the stewards of land and livestock in the Southwest, Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers Association. And, uh, and I can just tell you, on a, as many of y'all are uh, out there in, the, in this crowd, some of whom are on our board and a lot of you are members, um, as, as I travel around the state and, and, and talk a lot uh, to our members, either in person or on the phone or via email even or even text message now, uh, it's very obvious to me that, that several dynamics are, are really happening, which y'all have heard about today, and it's very real. And that is, is that the... Obviously, landowners out there right now are, as Senator Hager mentioned, uh, battling a record drought. We've just got done. Uh, Tom Bogus is here, as he knows better than anybody in this room, dealing with uh, wildfires that have spread across this state like we've never seen. Uh, Three million acres plus and over 6,000 miles of fence lost uh, in this state. And then we, we have the government come along and say, we're going to propose... We want to regulate your stock tanks now. We want to, we want to redefine the, nav, uh, the waters of the U.S. We want to define what rural dust is. And I wish I had a picture, speaking of Texas Tech, of the Overton Hotel and the, the yeah. dust storm that came in there a couple of months ago. And I'd like to challenge anybody to, to uh, determine how you're going to regulate a dust storm like, like they saw. Naturally occurring dust. We're going to regulate endangered species on everybody's property, and the list goes on and on and on, not to mention all the, the, the many, many eminent domain battles that are taking place all over the state as we speak. And, and I think, to, to Senator Hager's point, they, what do you expect a landowner to, to do uh, when all they want to do is continue to farm or ranch and continue to do uh, to provide, put food on the table. We talk a lot about foreign oil. This is a, I mean, what about foreign food? Uh, what are we going to do when, when, uh, when there aren't any more options left? And I think that that is a, a, a reason why TSCRA is very proud to be uh, uh, co, uh, have a good relationship, you might say, and be a, a good partner with TALT because it provides some outside the box ideas and some voluntary measures which landowners can do. Um, and not only through TALT, but other, there's other, plenty of other avenues. But landowners need tools in the toolbox. It's not to say they're going to pick up the tool and use it necessarily, but they need options to be able to go to and, and, and have some things to, to, to pick from. And I'm not just talking about conservation easements, but, but also other, you know, a lot of other um, uh, programs and, and things that are out there. But to Drew's point, I think we've, we've got to continue to put that face on agriculture. And that is really critical. When I was working back, when I was uh, working for Senator Duncan, we dealt we dealt a lot with brush control, 
or uh, I think we're calling it water supply enhancement now, and that what we're calling it now, Senator Hager, something like that. Um, but it's it's how important is brush control now to somebody that lives in an urban or suburban setting? Do you think people that have a little bit different opinion of why brush control is important now versus back even just a, a year ago? Uh, it's those kinds of things where we're going to have to really continue, I, I believe, to, uh, to to work together and and, and not only uh, come up with win-win solutions, but but also come with with market-driven solutions that I think Drew hit the nail on the head on. That the, it is very consumer-driven, because if you're battling the desert sand dunes lizard in West Texas, you've got a problem. You've got a you've got a, a situation right in your backyard all of a sudden that that you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to. Uh, whether you're going to participate in that problem or, or, or try to be a solution to that problem or, or, or build a wall and, and be the la try to be the last one standing. Unfortunately, a lot of times landowners, it, it doesn't, as many of y'all know, it, it's, it doesn't become a problem until it's in your backyard. And, uh, and that's what we're going to have to continue to do, I think, to stay, stay ahead of that curve <coughs> and, uh, and provide those voluntary uh, ways for landowners to, uh, to, to tap into that and, and to, to try to to stay ahead of this this really fast dynamic uh, situation that, that we find ourselves in. I don't know what kind of a uh, program you put together up here, uh, Blair, because there's at least five agricultural economics degrees sitting up here, and most of the time you don't ever put that many uh, that many uh, people on a panel who are going to preach market-based solutions to you. But uh, I do appreciate, uh, yeah, I do appreciate what uh, what uh, Dr. Wilkins had to say because. Uh, you know, I go back to my dad telling me the first time he ever heard people preaching, uh, you know, we've got to add value to agricultural, basic raw agricultural products. And the first time he ever heard that was at A&M in the fall of 1960 uh, in his second year up there. And, you know, as he says, you know, we're no closer to uh, coming up with a, a good description of what value added is. And we find it. And it works really well for some folks and not so well for others, Drew. We'll talk about what those issues might be. Uh, over cocktails later, but uh, that's one of those things, uh, uh, kind of like rural development, uh, that they've been trying to figure out what we're going to do. We've had rural development uh, efforts as long as we've had farm program efforts, and uh, our organization that I work for, the Texas Farm Bureau, uh, a lot of times when they bring, whether it's the American or to the, uh, especially the Texas Farm Bureau, and folks bring the, the next great rural development scheme to us, we're able to say, you know what, we've been through lots of towns. When farmers and ranchers are making money, those rural towns seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, we go through one of our uh, sporadic agricultural depressions um, that we've uh, crawled out of in the last several years. Um, uh, we seem to have a lot of problems in our rural communities. I think we're, our biggest problem that we've got right now, and, and Blair, I, I appreciate the work that, that you and your board of directors are doing working for this, because I think you're attempting to, you're attempting to bridge a lot of disconnects that are out there. You're bridging a rural, and I don't say rural urban disconnect, Senator, you hit it on the head. We don't find that we have a lot of problems with our, with your urban colleagues. We've got problems with your suburban colleagues. When you're dealing with somebody who's a third generation CPA or, uh, or attorney or muffler shop owner in one of these ring suburbs, uh, they're not, they're just not real close to, to what a lot of our folks uh, and what a lot of you are all about. Uh, I think we've got a where does your food come from versus, you know, farms versus HEB deal. And, uh, you know, that's a nice trite statement that we can say. Everybody knows some second grade class that somebody asks a question, where does your milk come from? And, and they get that and we laugh at it and we don't do anything about it. Uh, I would applaud the, the efforts that TDA is doing, uh, what they're doing working with 4-H and FFA and uh, other statewide organizations to make sure that, uh, uh, that, we, that we actually do something about it. But I think really... And I'll talk a little bit uh, politically because I spend a lot of time working national political issues uh, with some of our good friends out in the audience. Uh, and I think our big disconnect we got right now is the, is the hell no versus let's just do it already uh, group that's out there. Uh, you know, I, I look at land use and, and one of the things, uh, Carter, I'll steal from one of your questions you'd said you might pose. Uh, one of the greatest drivers of land use in this country since Hoover in the, in the federal farm program in 1930 um, has, has been federal um, has been federal agricultural programs. Uh, whether we've moved from the from the allotment uh, in the in the crop and livestock destruction days all the way to a, to a very decoupled uh, carrot not stick oriented policy uh, that we have right now. God only knows what we're heading to next. 
I think the scariest thing, and in, in, in Dr. Wilkins, you, you point to it, and I'm sure you will as well, David, uh, is um, not knowing where we're headed. Um, you know, six, seven million acres of land, even in, a, in, a, in an area as big as the United States, uh, is a lot of land to worry about uh, in our very frantic, disorganized, and, and a 110% budget-driven crunch uh, to try to write a farm bill in about a blink of an eye, LG, compared to how we usually write them. Um, you know, there was, uh, it was just a foregone conclusion. Yeah, we're going to cap CRP at 25 million acres or 24 or 20 or everybody had a number, but it's a foregone conclusion. We're going to lower that cap on CRP, 13, 14 million acres, roll 8 to 10 million acres for sure of it out. Uh, what do you do with it? Uh, what do you do with all this marginal land uh, that got pulled out in our, in our, uh, in our market-driven, uh, not program-driven, because we've got a decoupled farm program right now, our market-driven um, boom, uh, boom in all of our field crop and all of our field commodities over the last several years. It's moved literally millions of acres um, out, of the, out of the tree lines, uh, uh, into, uh, into actual crop production. Uh, listen to several of my colleagues over the last couple of weeks uh, start to wrap their hands around what some of USDA's long run projections is. And USDA saying is as, as quickly uh, as three years from now, really as quickly as two years from now in 13, uh, they think we'll start, our total pl US planted acres are gonna start going down uh, and give another three or four million acres uh, that we're currently planting, planted in 2011. Uh, back, uh, I turn you loose with 14, 15 million acres uh, of pretty marginal agricultural land uh, located and, and spread out all over this country. Uh, I tell you, we've got a we've got a big land use uh, uh, crisis coming up in in lots of this in lots of this country. Um, what happens? Uh, another foregone conclusion: we were going to take. Whip and and all of all of our alphabet soup of our two dozen plus. Uh, working lands programs, we were going to collapse them down into one or two federal working lands programs. Uh, do, we, do we collapse all that and keep all the benefits, uh, a lot of really good regional benefits, but very small and regionalized that come from some of those programs? Uh, do we lose that? And Title I in our commodity programs. Uh, We've been in a decoupled framework where it hadn't mattered, you know, your payments have been almost completely, except for our marketing loan programs, completely decoupled from what your current year's production was or your past year's or the year before that production was. Um, what happens if we move to a farm bill where, uh, where any federal assistance, and that's probably the word we're gonna have to use, a, a little bit of federal sponsorship, <laughs> not subsidy, um, when that, if that moves back and gets tied to actual annual production. Uh, Senator, I think uh, and, uh, some of that rice land over on the other side of Houston and, and even some out on your west side, uh, you decouple uh, payments uh, or you recouple payments back to actual production, you're gonna see some folks in the cow business uh, that might have to reassess, uh, might have to reassess uh, if they wanna continue to raise cattle out on the Katy Prairie. Uh, or out around Winnie and places like that. So I mean, there's there's a lot that that happened. I think cow calf producers, uh, which I'm proudly one, or have, have historically been the world's worst about saying, ah, get that farm bill away from me. There's nothing in it for me. Uh, and Joe, this one proves uh, as much as any other year um, that there's as much impact on land use that comes in the state of Texas from what the federal farm program does uh, as what we do through our agricultural. Uh, and wildlife, open space appraisal, uh, and, and, and all of our urban, our continuing shifting urban and suburban patterns. Glenn, the craziest thing about what you said is in 20 years when where you live is the, is the population center of Houston, uh, there's no way we're going to be raising cattle in Austin County because that means I'm going to be living then where you are now. Uh, and, there's, and there's no room for that space. And uh, it's sad. Uh, in lots of in lots of respects, but then we have to go back and remember we started growing. We we needed to grow food and grow livestock close to where the people lived. Um, we'll just continue to get pushed out with that setting sun out to the west. Um, I'm just extremely concerned uh, about what this hell no versus boys and girls. We really got to address some some hard choices over the next couple of years and where this superheated political rhetoric that we find ourselves in, especially at the national level, 
uh, what that means uh, and what, uh, what the collateral damage is uh, to efforts uh, that we're making on behalf of, uh, behalf of agricultural producers and folks that are trying to put programs in place to ensure um, this passed on heritage for another two or three or more generations like we've had handed over to us. With that. Howdy. Howdy. I'm going to uh, do something a little bit different. I'm going to talk, uh, try to give us a little historical perspective on all this because I think that it's germane and meaningful. And I'm going to kind of talk about the, what I think are the linchpins to our outreach to urban and suburban, and that's water and conservation easements. You know, everybody understands water. Uh, there's a lot more understanding and acceptance, as a lot of the speakers have shown today, about conservation easements. So we ought to use the simple tools first. I'm not sure how many people who live in the apartments in Austin and San Antonio appreciate the aesthetic value of private land but I know that they understand water, so I'm gonna kind of restrict my comments to water. And I'm gonna start with some quotes, and they, they kind of prove why I'm optimistic, especially after today. So thanks, Blair and Richard and everybody and the sponsors for putting this on. And if you, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna read them. The first quote is to protect your rivers, protect your mountains. That came from Emperor Yu of China, 1600 BC. Soil and water are not two organic systems, but one. Both are organs of a single landscape. A derangement in either affects the health of both. Aldo Leopold, 1941. What happens on the land affects the amount of water in the aquifers and the rivers. They're all integral parts of the water cycle. Andy Sansom. Last quote for now, saving the water and the soil must start where the first raindrop falls, Lyndon Johnson, and it falls in Texas on private land. The reason I bring this up is, we've been talking about this just on those quotes for 3,611 years. We've been talking about land stewardship for 3,000, three and a half thousand years. Steve Nelly has a quote that I tried to find and couldn't find it that takes it back even farther than that. But I think the momentum is starting to peak a little bit and in, especially in the last 20 or 30 years uh, as evidenced by some of the ideas and some of the comments and some of the examples that we've talked about today. And just to show you how far we've come in Texas, I participated in a rally, a march on the Capitol in 1994. And it was against just about everything that we have talked about here today. There are 4,500 people. The Associated Press the next day and the story dropped to zero but I talked to, I personally talked to, my wife will attest, I personally talked to the commander, the trooper who was in charge who did the crowd count. It's 4,500 is what he said. 4,500 people, the crowd stretched from the south steps of the Capitol all the way back down to the Congress Avenue Bridge. And they all gathered on the south lawn of the Capitol and right down front, were your current governor and your current gov and your current state comptroller. They were they led the march. Anybody has a hard time keeping up with Susan Combs, they really had a hard time <coughs> keeping up with her on that day. But the conversation has changed. As you can see by this room and who's in it, and Steve Lewis sitting right up there on the video earlier talking about what we all, most of us, felt was a communist plot. And yet here we are because the conversation has changed finally 
after many thousands of years, it looks like it's beginning to change in Texas. And I'll close with one final quote. Reed, he put up on the screen, I don't do PowerPoints either. I'm suspicious of technology that in order to turn it off, you hit the start button. <laughs> but Reed put it up on the screen, but he only did the first sentence. It's my all-time favorite quote from Leopold. The, sen the sentence that he put up there was, oh, I'll read them both, including the second one. Conservation will ultimately boil down to rewarding the private landowner who conserves the public interest. It asserts the new premise that if he fails to do so, his neighbors must ultimately pay the bill. That's why the conversation has changed. I think people understand, particularly with water, is that if they don't do something to help the water situation, and one of those ways, one of those many, some of those many tools are conservation easements and helping private landowners stay on the land and reducing fragmentation and all the other problems we've heard about today. Jessica said the conversation has changed, and I think that's exactly right, and I think that's why we all can be optimistic for maybe the first time in at least 3,500 years, and hopefully we can go forward from here and craft those messages that will resonate so that the people who live in the apartment houses in captivity down here in the asphalt and glass and steel and rooftops and driveways will understand at least for their water supply why some of these programs we've talked about all day are important. Thank you. Thank you all. That was a great series of opening comments. Um, let me just kind of kick it off with a question, and then I want to turn to the audience and hear what's on your mind. And I guess I want to build on what David talked about, and it's that question of water, uh, what arguably should be a great uniter, uh, irrespective of whether we live in a suburb or in a rural part of the state or in downtown Houston. Um, and David uh, wisely comment at, commented that uh, if we're going to protect our water, we have to protect our private lands because that's where the rainfall comes, it's where it enters our aquifers, it's where our springs emanate, and where the land around our rivers, creeks, and streams are ultimately protected. Yet Senator Hager commented that um, uh, a, a piece of legislation in the last session, uh, known as a water stewardship bill, that uh, would have authorized a change in ag use valuation to allow landowners to switch to water stewardship as an incentive to keep their land intact fail uh, in the midst of the worst drought that many of us have seen in any of our lifetimes. And I'm curious about kind of how we reconcile the failure of Prop 8, the water stewardship bill, versus what we know and what we hear from all Texans is that they care about water. They want to invest in water, and they recognize that we have to protect it. And so let me open that up to any of you who want to comment on that. I'll just start. I mean, in my opinion, as I go around and talk to my constituents and give a lot of speeches on the constitutional amendments, which I can tell you the absolute speech that I hate to give more than any other speech is constitutional amendments. And why? Because you can't hardly explain them. People read them, they don't know what they say, and then you got to stand up there and try to explain every single one of them. This one was easier because it was only 10. Try a few years ago when we had 22 and keep people awake. That's a hard thing. But, but I think, number one, as, as kind of the pushback that, that I would get in parts of my district were to that, and even number one, which did pass, which had to deal with freezing people's property, residents, that is, if there was a disabled veteran, and then that would roll over to the disabled veteran's spouse. And there was pushback to that. Um, not, not because people were not supportive of our military personnel and especially our totally disabled veterans, and Texas has more veterans than any other state in the nation and has more people here that are actively in the military. But, but the thing was is that it was a swap to it's giving you a benefit. What am I getting a benefit out of it? And I think there's a lot of that in society is that, well, how do I get a benefit out of this? Uh, we had a significant amount of discussion and um, 
Jason made talking about uh, when you were working at Senator Duncan's office and talking about brush control, and then now we term that as a, you know, it's a waterman enhancement program that in the last legislative session, prior to session, as I chaired Sunset, uh, one of the discussions we had is how do we deal with brush control? And there really was a significant push to eliminate those types of programs because people said, well, the collective society doesn't get a benefit out of that. That's just some landowner that gets a benefit, which is a significant disconnect to what it does in reality. And I think that that, in part, is the reason. Nothing more, nothing less. I think people do appreciate water. They do appreciate the significant drought that we had this year. But the end result of how does that get an end to a means is the question that people don't quite grasp or want to vote for because they don't know how the connection's there. Just my opinion. I'd, I'd follow on to that. I'm still a little mystified that two passed and eight failed. Uh, I figured in the, in the year where constitutional amendment elections with the exception of a, of a, of a state house special election wholly in Brazos County, that was the only thing that was on the ballot anywhere in the state. Um, the highly motivated, very politically interested, very keyed in folks are the ones who turn out. I figured everything that had anything to do with money, directly uh, money, uh, authorizing those, those additional 600 billion in bonds, how, how that passed by almost the, by almost the, the flipped percentage uh, of where this one fails really mystifies me. But I, th I think it goes back to that first disconnect that I talked about that uh, I, I feel uh, for somebody, and this is not a paid political commercial for Glenn Hager, uh, but- But, but take, go ahead and do it. Take it if you want. <clears throat> uh, I, feel, I feel for the folks uh, that, that, have, that have got some sort of hands in the dirt background uh, and there's lots of them. They're not farmers up here, but they've, right. they've got that kind of they've got that kind of connection uh, back to back to reality uh, that are that are trying to get something done. I, I felt sorry for them um, for 140 days plus uh, this year. I feel very sorry for them as they're uh, as they're heading into a fairly uh, unsettled, but I'd say unchanged political environment as as we move out. And I just I wish I had. Um, I, I can say this so the senator probably doesn't have to. I wish I had more confidence uh, that, that we were going to be closer to being able to, to address uh, and, and really start moving the ball down the road instead of kicking the can like we heard all this last year uh, in 2013, and more so than we did in 2011. And I just don't know what's going to have to happen, Senator, for us to, for us to get back there. But we've, we have deferred. This lack of a shared vision has caused us to defer some of these decisions 3,600 years. I don't know if we're going to get it done in the next two years or not. Yeah, David. Um, I have some specific comments about Proposition 8. I have a little bit different perspective because I worked on and was a, kind of the center of the hurricane back there with a lot of, with several others of, at that time, Proposition 11, the Wildlife Management Tax Valuation. I, I, how in the world would you read that language of that to start with? It was confusing. It was confusing on the proposition. It looked like a tax break. We're going to give all those fat cat ranchers a big tax break. That's what it is how the language was. The, the other thing was uh, there was three things that, or rather than talk about um, that particular uh, amendment, we'll, I'll talk about the wildlife management deal, Prop 11. The reason it passed. It, it was marketed and sold and explained correctly. We had a broad coalition. I'll, I'll tell you how I think it ought to be done. You put a broad coalition. We had every we had every farm group. We had every ranch group. We had every hunting group. Every fishing group. Every environmental group. Church groups. We had everybody out supporting that deal. Everybody. Everybody from the Farm Bureau to the Sierra Club. They were all talking to editorial boards and radio and TV stations and talking about what good thing, what it was going to be. Everything they said was revenue neutral. He already had to have an ag value. It wasn't going to affect the money. It goes to the school districts. If anything smelled like it stole money from school children, it was dead on arrival. And everywhere we went, we talked about revenue neutral. We also talked about you had to work to qualify for it. The, the big deal about, you know, the, the situation with how hard you have to work to, to do your wildlife management deal. Well, that's because that's 
the only way it was going to pass. It wasn't going to get out of the House or the Senate without that. It, you could, we, had, we told everybody that you could not hang it up a hummingbird feeder and move to the Cayman Islands and keep your tax break. You had to work at it. So th there, those three elements in a marketing plan plus some language that people could understand in the constitutional amendment, and I think it would have passed. Yeah, good. Good observations. Anybody else have any comments on that? Get that covered. Let me open it up to the audience and see if anybody has any questions out there. Anybody? Yeah, Bill. Yeah. Oh, thank you, buddy. This question, in fact, is for you. Uh, and I'm thinking of uh, some experience I've had in uh, working uh, to prevent land fragmentation uh, in the western part of the hill country and having to interface with the urban area of San Antonio and Austin and this whole thing about the disconnect uh, and the understand I mean talk about uh, at least Mr. Langford's got something that is really clear cut the water faucet in the house in in an apartment is just like the water faucet in my house on a ranch but <clears throat> Fragmentation is just, it's too far out there from an apartment to figure out what that means. But is it possible that, in fact, if it's true that the state of Texas ranks 50th in the nation in its ability to provide open space to its citizens, that we are now paying the price of this disconnect? Good question, Bill. And I'll tell you, I'm paid to ask these gentlemen questions today. And so um, I want to I want to turn it over to my colleagues on the on the on the panel and ask them. And I, Drew, let me start with you because um, you touched on this notion of values um, and shared values, and it speaks to the language that we speak and the, how we make sure that people and audiences uh, in places that grew up with different backgrounds from ours uh, understand the relevance and importance of the kind of issues that Bill are talking about. How do we how do we bridge that divide? Well, yes, the answer to the question is yeah, we're you're, we're paying a price for years of message neglect, in my opinion. We've we've had the right things to say. We've we've always been about producing the safest, most affordable food supply in the world, but we've probably said it so many times. And what did you say, Neil? Uh, everything that needs to be said has already been said. It's just not been said by by everyone that needs to say it. Um, I, I kind of compare it to this this last interim there were hearings in the Texas House on various tax special tax considerations including agricultural land valuation and agricultural sales tax uh, exemptions uh, there was a hearing that I ended up catching from my office on the television on the on television and person after person went up to testify that the reason agriculture needed these things is because agriculture's profit margins are, are increasingly tight. We have high input costs because agriculture is core to every community, um, because agriculture is, and fill in the blank with the same things we've always said, and I hopped up from my desk, ran over to the Capitol, barely got there in time to fill out a witness card, and said, you know, one thing that I think maybe you're missing, the question was asked from a Houston legislator, what, what do I tell my superintendent who gets this report? They had a report from the comptroller's office that, that had a page in a 400-page report showing the cost of all of these special tax considerations. And the agriculture ones were the biggest numbers on the page. And he says, what do I tell the superintendent or the mother in my district who says, this is what these are costing me. I said, well, I'm offended that someone would explain it as a cost, although I know that people who look at things, who live their lives in tax, in tax world and tax collection world, that's the way they have to look at it. But I'm offended that someone would look at an agricultural policy as a cost when we have the safest, the most affordable food supply in the world. 10% of, less than 10% of our disposable income is spent on food. That's the, that's the benefit of these policies. We've got to figure out, and I'm not saying it right today, we need somebody a lot better than me to come up with a way to say that that makes that legislator from Houston ask the question next time, how do we quantify the, the gain to my, my, tech, my consumer and to my school superintendent? Um, that's the question we need them asking, but today they're asking, how do I defend the cost? Well, 
the water stewardship exemption is the same thing. I read that. I had family members who read that and said, do we really need another tax break when, we, when we've got the, the budget situation we have today? Well, it's, it's a water enhancement policy is what it is. And maybe we needed to be voting on a water enhancement action as opposed to a tax consideration. Did I dodge the question well enough? Yeah, Neil. So uh, I, the way I look at it is we need to bounce that type of problem, which is a hard problem, over to science and technology. For gosh sakes, we can detect contaminants in water right now to the parts per billion, right? And are you telling me that if we can detect contaminants at a parts per billion level because of a technological advances, that we are not able to figure out how to quantify, measure, and support the public benefits that you and I know are there from, frag from not fragmenting a, a, a portion of, of West Texas, um, and if, if, if we could all look at that and say, well, there's huge public benefits by, uh, by maintaining this landscape as intact, and we haven't challenged our, our science and technological um, uh, capacities in the state and the nation to figure out how to put together standardized metrics in order to measure the public benefit that comes from those private lands so that if, in fact, we do lay out some scenarios and give people choices, they're able to look and see what they're going to forego if in fact they make the choice, in fact in your, in, in your case, running that Cres line through, through the middle of the hill country bill. Um, it, we've got to challenge our, our universities and our scientists to put together the, the, the metrics. And that's part of what we need to do in order to be able to create uh, eventually a market system for uh, ecosystem services off of private lands and make agriculture pay uh, in, in, a, in a more holistic way. If I can use the word holistic here, can I do that? Jim? I, I can follow up in, in one minute, and I'm looking at the clock to do it. Uh, amen to everything that you just said, but I'm going to put a caveat on the end of it. We have, we've had the right message. We've had science. We've had economics behind us. Drew, that's what got you out of your chair and ran you over to the Capitol to testify that day, uh, is who the messenger is. And I think we're dealing, most of us when we get in these rooms, uh, I'm 41 years old and I'm still just about the youngest person except for my little friend in the back uh, who's, who's in these rooms. Uh, we, don't, we don't, the folks who are making the decisions and the malleable little mushy minds that are out there that are going to make these decisions 20, 30 years from now uh, that most of us in the old folks home are going to have to live with, uh, they trust different folks. The American Farm Bureau Federation has been part of a consortium that for 30 years has done an annual public opinion poll, and its main goal is to track one thing. Joe, it's the old Ipsos poll that you've seen. And the main thing is the goal is to, tr to, to track longitudinally the trustworthiness of farmers and ranchers, period, paragraph. The, the cornerstone question of that is among university professors, uh, government employees, uh, boom, bada, boom, bada, boom, all the different people, that newscasters, uh, editorial board writers. Uh, who, is, who do you trust the most to learn about your food um, and, and, your, and your near environment from? Uh, and forever it was farmers. That got overtaken a couple of years ago by someone like me. Now, ponder that one. 65% plus of the population trust. Find out about what's happening with their, with their food. Quality, safety, but issues surrounding what is essential to life. Water from somebody like me get the message right, spend more time selecting and training your messenger that's out there. And it's not just going uh, to be one messenger. Everything you said is exactly right. Uh, but, if, but if we try to pour all of that into the shot glass uh, at once, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna just frustrate ourselves a little bit. And Blair, we talked about that when you and your board were up. I think that's our, our principal challenge uh, to making meaningful progress on these issues.
Jim, you, you talked about the messenger and just how important that is as well as the message. And you also uh, captured, I think, one of the, the, the biggest looming threats on the horizon that's germane to everything we're talking about today, and that's that land use crisis you referenced with land coming out of farm bill programs, the dust storm that enveloped the Overton Hotel in Lubbock. Um, how bad would it be if we didn't have the CRP program? And so what are your messages to an audience that is disconnected, that don't understand the value of the Farm Bill programs and how important they are as incentives to protect our soil, our air, our water, our land, our game? Um, how do we get a public to care and be concerned about the specter of a potential $23 billion cut? Uh, there's kind of two separate issues there. First, first to, your, to your initial point, uh, I, I think you get outside the box and you, and, and you carefully choose uh, who those messengers are, who you use, Drew, uh, to your points, uh, to your slides that Drew showed up there. We're rolling out for the first time in 60 years a brand new brand identity for Texas Farm Bureau. We've got six posters hanging up in our cafeteria right now. I looked at it and said, well, there's only one poster of an old white guy on it. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've probably already, you know, we've, we've preached to the choir probably long enough on that. Uh, to your second point uh, about what this, hopefully the cut's only 23 billion over, over nine instead of over 10 now that we're going to defer this farm bill debate uh, back into next year. Uh, I've always had this thought in mind and it's been enunciated on this panel twice so far. Um, I get a little PO'd because I think the American people have had a, have had a pretty good deal uh, for, the last, uh, for the last 81 years uh, in terms of the terribly small proportion of tax revenues uh, that wind up going uh, to stabilize, and I'm not going to repeat the Stenholm quote for the third time up here, um, but, but to have a, a good, stable, abundant, safe food supply. It, it's been a heck of a deal, but it, it's, you start with that message and it starts to sound like this and we've got to avoid messages that that look taste and sound like that because we we don't get anywhere with those yeah good jason i think one of the key things people need to keep in mind is that when we're talking about the farm bill the majority of the farm bill is not issues that we deal with on a, i mean we're dealing with obviously nutrition issues we want good as everybody has said good quality food for everybody but the the majority of the farm bill are nutrition programs food stamp programs all that type of stuff it's not it's not um, conservation programs and some of these things that we talk so when we take that that invariably i think when we take that cut are the rest of the society going to be willing to take that cut their their share of the cut as well and i think that that I mean, that's the elephant in the room, and that's real unpopular to say, well, we're going to take, we're going to steal the food out of the mouths of children. Um, I mean, that's the, the accusation. Um, but that's, that's at, at what point are we going to, um, to sit down at a, at a table and say, okay, what's, what's good for some is also good for others, and, and we've got to figure out a way to, to, to share this pot of money here. Um, the la lastly, I would just say too is there there are a lot of uh, a lot of other things outside the farm bill, um, which have I would argue even a, a bigger impact than a twenty three billion dollar cut to the farm bill, um, to to what we do on a day to day basis, particularly in Texas with respect to to uh, uh, land stewardship and and raising beef or cotton or rice or corn or whatever. Um, is it is the farm bill important? Yes, but is it the only game in town? Absolutely not. So I think, I think that's, we can't spend all of our time worrying about what's going to happen or not happen with the farm bill. It's just, it is just one, one piece of the overall regulatory uh, federal government pie that we got to deal with, so. Yeah, good admonition. Anything else out there? Yeah, Carolyn. Sometimes I feel like I'm the 3,000 year old in the audience. I'm Carolyn Vogel. And I want to do just a little bit of a, a, you know, look back and then look to right here, because this is really all we can deal with is the moment we're in. And the look back is 1993, 1994, 95. And uh, David's words were so, were so salient, pertinent. Uh, I remember sitting on the stage with a number of you here. And, uh, um, you know, we were just starting the uh, education about conservation easements. 
And so fast forward to today and look where we're at. In incredible progress and now we're begging and salivating a Bob Wagner every time I go to a workshop in New York or someplace and sit down and listen to the purchase of development rights funding in other states. I come back to Texas, you know, salivating and then, you know, remotivated to move forward. Now, perspective from my perch, um, somebody used the word disconnect. And I want to say, in as, in as much heartfelt to all of you in the room, but I feel the disconnect a little bit more today than I did a few years ago. And I'm, I'm gonna leave you then, and, and I'm, that's not a judgment. That's a call to, for me, to ask, what's that about? And uh, I'll leave it at that. This room does not represent the entire conservation business in Texas today nor the entire agriculture business. And I know Blair gave it every effort, and I commend her for that. This is an incredible program. This auditorium should have been full. And I wish my colleagues had been here. But I want to say, again, it's Carolyn Vogel's perspective and perch. There's a little more disconnect, and we've got to work on it. I mean, what I mean by a little more is a little more than a few years ago. I don't know the answers and the reasons, but I want to work on it. Anybody else out there have a question for the panel? Anybody? Yes, sir, Mr. Kofer. Gentlemen, George Kofer, uh, I wear both my tree hugger hat as a land trust executive director and a rancher in Uvalde County since 1880 and proud of both those hats. My question for you is, what are the next steps and how do we get to an interim study where we can openly discuss the various revenue sources for incentivizing private land stewardship, uh, real estate transfer tax, um, lottery, all the out-of-the-box things that other states are using. How do we get that conversation going? I'll start. It, you know, it's not really that difficult to ask for an interim study on issues, but I think one of the things that I've realized is the question is, who's going to be directing that ship? Because there's a lot of times that maybe I'm even on a committee, but I want to push forward an issue, but I don't ask for an interim study, and the reason is is because I'm not too confident on how what the report's going to look like, and then I'm going to get a phone call, and let's see, it's uh, probably about, I guess, 5.15 in the afternoon. The report needs to be turned in today at 5, and I get a phone call about 9 from my staff and says, well, Senator Chairman so-and-so's office wants to know if you'll sign the report. I go, well, what report? Well, we're emailing it to you. And uh, there's many times that I've seen someone say, I'm not signing that. Uh, we need to have a discussion. And, and there's no real ill intent there, but it's not done in a manner that really, I guess, um, vets out all the issues. And so I, I think that discussion obviously needs to occur because you need to have revenues to be able to, uh, to, to deal with issues. But at the same time, even once you have the report in this environment around here, the question is about timing. If you want to have a piece of legislation last session, huh, not going to be much money left. It's all going to be taken. And, and so, you know, that, that's one of them. I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention one thing. It's a little off, but I just want to say this one comment that we're talking about private lands. And part of the question is the benefits the private land provides to really the public in, in total. And the other day I was driving down the road, which I drive a lot down the road in my district. Um, that's what happens when you got a district the size of mine. But I was driving down the road and there was a there was a little bit of debate going on about some of the Occupy X, fill in, fill in the town, uh, Occupy which one, which one, which one. And, and it was interesting to me because I hadn't thought about something that they were mentioning in one of the larger cities about the cost that the city or the taxpayers were going to incur to haul away all the trash, the garbage, and the temporary settlements that put into place. And one of the commentators said, if being that this was in the city park, people showed up and that they had a cause, but then they just left it in disarray and could care less. But if it was their own private home, guess what? <laughs> They'd have taken the trash out that attended to it. And my point being is this, is the messaging that the public benefits significantly from privately held lands, even if it's not significantly 
fragmented, which I believe my family, we want to keep our land and we want to take good care of it. Why? We've been there since 1846. People value the property that they have and the discussions have to occur, but they have to make sure that some of the right people are leading the discussion and don't in essence say, okay, that's a great idea for a revenue source, but I got a better place to spend it. Because in this building, you better watch that out. Um, ask Carter if he knows anything about it, money that's over in their, in their area. Um, people will take it and spend it on something else in a heartbeat. And that, that's the only thing that I have fear about this building. I've seen that too many times. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Senator. Anybody else, Drew? I'll just take it a step further and say it depends on it. A lot of the success of the request depends on who's asking for it. And I hope nobody takes offense, but if anybody in this room asks for what you're asking for, it, it doesn't have the credibility that it needs to get passed. It's got to come from the people who are the users of the environmental benefit of those programs, the, the, the consumers of clean air, the consumers of clean water, the consumers of food. Those are the people who need to be asking a question. I see Stan uh, Metter here. Every time Stan comes and talks to us about something, he, he's coming, he's bringing an idea to us with a perspective of, you know, this isn't, this isn't about me and how it's going to benefit my family, but here's an idea that has potential benefit to the whole state and the consumers of the products we all produce. We've got to figure out how to bring those people into this room. Uh, I suspect if you had a conference titled How to Make Your, how, how to make your Gas Price Lower, you might get some urban consumers that might want to come be part of a conference like that. A conference on how to make your food price lower in the next few years, we might, we might get a little attention on that, but we've got to figure out what those questions are that bring those people into the room so that those are the people driving the train, asking for it. Otherwise, it's agriculture, it's land stewards, which sounds great, but again, when policy officials see agriculture and land stewards walking down the street, they still see, well, what are you getting out of this? Poignant reminder. Thank you, Drew. Let one last question from the audience before we turn it over to Blair to uh, talk about next steps. Anybody out there? Anybody? Okay, let's give our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen. We thank our panel. We thank all our speakers today, our sponsors, the wonderful folks who helped us organize this. What, what happens next? What comes next here? Uh, we, TALT, came into this process of putting together this conference without any prescription. We didn't come asking for anything. We're not asking the legislature for anything. We don't have any specific legislation in mind other than the idea that whatever solution to our natural resource problems we come up with have to start with the people on the ground, have to involve the people on the ground. It can't happen to them. They have to be part of the solution. We've presented projects today. You've heard some interesting speakers. The idea was to stimulate discussion. We've had some great discussion. This last panel discussion was wonderful. I wish it could go on. The next steps will depend largely on you all. This is, you've been a great audience, a patient audience, but there are a lot of people, as Carolyn said, and others that should be in this room and, and aren't. So what we do with what we've heard today will depend on, on you all and how you help us disseminate this information. As I've said several times today, we're going to put it online. It's not proprietary. Share it, forward it, crib from it, quote from it, put it in your press releases, whatever you want to do. It's, it's out there in the public domain. So once again, thank you for being here. I hope you'll join us for a cocktail up at the speaker's apartment and uh, continue some great discussion and, and hope to see you all again soon. Safe travels home. <laughs>